Welcome back to the ADP Nearshore PMP Study Group. This course is designed to complement your study efforts as you prepare to sit for PMI's Project Management Professional Certification Exam. My name is Dennis DaCosta and I'll be facilitating today's session on Project Integration Management. Before we begin, it's important that you've already completed Video 1 and Video 2 of this series. Video 1 is an introduction to project management. Video 2 is an introduction to the process chart. Both are very important videos that you need to have completed before you should begin on project integration management, which is the first knowledge area of 10 that we'll be covering throughout this series. Let's take a look at today's objectives. Today we're going to discuss the definition of project integration management. We're going to talk about the five process groups for which uh, processes for integration management uh, exist. There's the initiation, which is develop project charter. There's planning, which is planning uh, to develop your project management plan. There's executing, where you direct and manage project work. There's monitor and controlling, where you monitor and control the project work, as well as perform integrated change controls. And finally, the close process, which is where you close the project or you close a phase of the project. Let's move to our third slide in this deck, which is, what is project integration? So when you think of integration management, I want you to think of combining, unifying, or bringing together all the other elements within the knowledge areas. This is very important because your master plan or project management plan is found in the planning section of integration. Now, if you turn to page 61 on your, in your PEMBOOK guide, you will see a copy of the process chart. What I want you to do is kind of look, look, skim across all the different knowledge areas which are located on the left side of the column and, and look at how each of those knowledge areas contain processes. Notice one thing, project integration management contains processes within all the process groups. Now, when we talk about integration and combining and unifying, another thing that I want you to note about the process chart is as you scroll down through those knowledge areas on page 61 of your PMBOK guide, you'll notice like, um, at, develop a HR management plan. You're in that, in that particular knowledge area under planning, you're going to create a human resource management plan. That management plan, along with the other knowledge areas and those management plans that come from that knowledge area, are considered subsidiary plans. All those plans roll up into the project management plan, which is found under planning for your project integration management. So here's another way to look at this. When Let's look at project integration and developing a project management plan as a book. All the other knowledge areas are chapters within that book. So as you complete the different knowledge areas and planning sessions, you're going to be uh, rolling all those a subsidiary plans up into the master plan which becomes your project management plan. You're integrating, you're combining, unifying, joining to become one. Beginning on slide five. So let's look at the first process group for project integration management. This is the initiation process group. This is where you're going to develop the project charter that formally authorizes the existence of a project. A couple of key things to note here is that the project char charter officially sanctions the project and gives the authority to the project manager um, to perform the work and assign work 
Um, it also uh, identifies the resources, um, uh, authorizes resources. Resources could be materials, it could be applications, it could be, um, it could be people, it could be money. So it's really important that every project has a project charter. Some of the things that go into the project charter um, would be, for example, a business case. This is what's going to tell everybody um, the purpose of the project. Uh, you know, you'll have to do things like uh, get information from your client or get more, uh, do some research, maybe look at historical projects um, historical information from projects that have already been completed to help help guide you to build out this project charter. A couple of things about the project charter. It's required. It's going to authorize your project. Um, project charters are usually high level, not very detailed, because you want it to be um, detailed enough where it outlines the purpose uh, the authorization, and the general intent of the project so it stays valid throughout the course of your project. Because, you know, as you're working on your project, you're going to progressively elaborate on the key elements or details or specifics to, um, let's say, how many resources are needed, how much money is actually going to be spent and allocated in different areas. Um, you'll be developing the scope and the re building the requirements out at a later point in time. So you you don't want um, you don't want to throw in specifics here on your project charter. You want it to be high level enough so it stays valid through the course of your project. Moving on to slide six. Throughout this uh, web series, you're going to experience. Um, uh, presentations for each of the knowledge areas and in the knowledge areas there's going to be processes and for every process there's going to be um, an input tool technique and output. So what you see on page six are the ETOs, inputs, tools, techniques and outputs for the developed project charter. Let's take it, let's, let's go to slide seven. I want you to uh, understand a little bit more about why it's important to um, understand the EDOs. Here's an exam example. This is something I made up. Um, so you're in the initiation process for project integration management knowledge area. What tool or technique would you use? And then we see that there are tools and techniques listed. Why this is important and you need to understand which tools techniques belong in which areas and which don't is because you will get questions like this that are going to test do you understand what really goes into to performing something into a particular process? So um, go ahead. You can look at that on your own time. We're not going to go through that now. But I, I just wanted you to know why it's important that you understand the EDOs. Okay, on slide eight, let's, let's look at some of the inputs to develop, pro uh, to develop your project charter. Um, you'll need a variety of different things when it comes to you creating a project charter for whatever projects you're working on. Um, but here, here's some examples, like a project statement of work. This is going to have, this will be the key product scope description, what your deliverables are going, going to be. Um, you may have a business case, which is going to outline the business need, the justification, a cost benefit analysis, and establish the boundaries. Um, for which a project will be about. Um, you can have agreements like contracts, uh, LOIs, and then there's environmental enterprise factors. These are like industry standards, regulations, marketplace conditions. Um, also, the organizational culture in itself could help outline how you're going to develop your project charter. Finally, there's OPAs, organizational process assets. Um, these could be templates, historical lessons learned. Um, uh, not only should you review them as you're developing your project 
charter, but you should be creating them throughout the course of you working on a project. It's very important to share your lessons learned to continually improve the overall process, not just for you, but for others that um, may come across to your information, your organizational process asset as uh, they embark on their projects. Okay, so let's Let's move over to slide nine and talk about the tools techniques for develop project charter. There are two that you see on the screen, expert judgment and facilitation technique. These will be um, uh, basically scattered throughout the rest of the 47 process groups. You may the process uh, processes themselves. Um, and it, they're really, it's, it's kind of common sense. So if you're going to be embarking on creating a uh, project charter. Um, maybe you've never done it before. Maybe you've never, uh, the, the concept behind this particular product, service, or result, you're not the expert. You're the project manager. You know how to run the project, it, uh, successfully run it, and make sure it stays favorable and is completed in a timely manner within cost, within budget, all that good stuff. So maybe you need to tap someone on the shoulder, a subject matter expert. So that's where expert judgment comes in. Either you have it or you seek to find someone who does have it, but that is a tool or technique that you will need to have to help create this project charter. Finally, there's facilitation techniques. When you're getting together and you're brainstorming and doing certain um, um, collaborations, um, it's very good it's a very good skill. It's a required skill for you as a project manager to be able to facilitate these types of conversations. Um, keep a goal in mind, uh, have an agenda, have these things outlined, and it's up to you as the project manager to facilitate these types of things. You may be able to have a subject matter expert do the facilitation, but the organization behind this is on you as the project manager. So facilitation technique is um, one of the two that exist in developing project charter. Let's jump down to slide 10 and let's look at the output. Obviously, what we're trying to accomplish is to develop the project charter. So our output for this process is going to be the project charter. A couple of things that we need to remember about the project charter is it officially sanctions our project to begin. It's going to outline the authorization for us to use resources to complete this project. It's going to be very high level and tell us what we're trying to accomplish. It's going to have high level um, budget and some constraints um, and some assumptions will be in there about the project. But most importantly, it's going to authorize and name the project manager. So another thing about the project charter that is important to know is that it really is the sponsor's responsibility and he takes, he or she will take ownership of the project charter. But as, as the assigned project manager, you may be involved heavily in creating and participating in the business analysis portion and gathering and conducting the facilitations to Co collaborate and gather all the information to create this project charter. But the responsibility of the project charter does lie on the sponsor. Okay, moving right along, let's go into the next process group. This is the planning process group under project integration management. This is where you are going to develop the project management plan. So as I had spoken about earlier, all the other knowledge areas are going to be developing a, a little plan of their own and those are considered subsidiary plans and those roll up into um, the master project plan. In the integration planning process for um, developing the project management plan, one thing that's important here to know is that you're going to um, plan and develop the plan for how you're going to manage the project. Okay, so this is, this is where you're going to plot the course for you to be successful in terms of completing this project. Um, how the work is done, what exactly is going to be done, how to handle risks. Um, you're going to outline your uh, baselines for schedule, 
cost, and scope. And although we haven't touched on um, cost, uh, schedule, or scope yet, as I mentioned earlier, all those other plans, once you get to them, will roll up. So, you know, really at this point, we're just outlining how we're going to execute this project. We'll later fill in the blanks in um, our project management plan once we get to those other knowledge areas. Another key point here is if you are someone who's invited to take over a project that's already begun, it's always important that you go back and you review the project management plan. You want to make sure that the project management plan is still valid and understand where they've been, where they're going, and where you're going to take it next. So um, if you take over a project, always check the project management plan. Okay, so let's go over to the ETOs for Development Management Plan. And one thing I want you to notice is that the output Develop Project Charter from the first uh, process group is now an input into this next ETO or this next process. And that's going to be something you'll see that's pretty common. You will see um, throughout the 47 process processes, um, a lot of them will look to the previous process, the output from the previous process as an input to the next process. So there's a lot of sequence um, sequencing that you're going to start to see when it comes to these processes. That's another key tip in helping you understand the process chart from video two. All right, so Let's jump into the inputs for develop management plan. You're going to have your project charter, plus you're going to have the outputs from the other processes which roll into or integrate into the project management plan. So things like um, the scope management plan, the time management plan, the work breakdown structure, which you'll get to when you get to the scheduling video, um, the HR management plan, the communication management plan, stakeholder management plan, risk, all those different uh, knowledge areas, those plans will roll up and become inputs into developing your project management plan. Let's look on slide 14 and talk about the tools and techniques. Again, like I mentioned earlier, you're going to see expert judgment facilitation techniques pop in throughout all um, or a majority of your tools and techniques for the other processes. So we're not going to sit too much on that screen. But finally, let's jump over to slide 15 and talk about the outputs. The output, of course, if we're the process is to develop the project management plan, the output would be creating the management plan. So your output here is going to be your project management plan. There's some very important things that I want you to look at that are going to kind of um, tell you what is going to be in your project management plan. You're going to have a few key elements, your scope baseline, your cost baseline, your schedule baseline, all the subsidiary plans, and your tailoring decisions. So tailoring, what does this mean? There's no uh, cut and dry way to managing a project, especially with uh, all the environmental factors, changes, client, uh, the organizational climate and cultures and things like that. And different projects are going to require different approaches. Um, this is the framework, the body of knowledge that a project manager should have. So when we, when we put that there should be, there would be tailoring decisions in here, maybe it's not that big of a project where you need to outline risks. Maybe it's a project that's not really going to have, um, some, uh, cost factors involved. So that's why you, you have your tailoring decisions to say um, no risk management plan needed or no, no cost management plan is going to be needed. So those are tailoring decisions where you're going to decide what, why something is not being done or you're going to tweak your approach just a little bit. So it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray area, but it all fits into the 
project management body of knowledge. So it's important that you know all this because when it comes to your exam, the Project Management Institute creates this exam with, in, with the purpose of you knowing your 47 processes, your 10 knowledge areas, and the five process groups. On slide 16. Next, we're going to talk about the executing process, uh, the executing process group. This is where you're directing and managing the project work. So, th when when we think of executing, here here's really what's going on. He, your project team is working on the deliverables. Okay, during the time they're working on the deliverables you're directing and managing the project work. So you could be collecting raw data on where they're at in, in terms of completing the work. Um, you may have received some approved changes that are um, going to be implemented, so you fold that into executing. There's a couple of things about um, uh, implementing approved changes, uh, corrective action, preventative, and deep defect repair. You're going to go through those um, a lot more when you get into quality, um, but it's an, important to know that corrective action is work in progress. So you're doing something and you notice that uh, it's a little off, so you, you tweak it and correct the action and um, that's while work is in process. Preventative is taking a step back and saying, hey, let's do this so just in case this happens, um, we don't have a problem. So your proactive approach, that's preventative. Defect repair is after you've already completed the work and you notice that it's a problem and you've got to go back and take care of it. So corrective action, preventative act, act preventative action and defect repair are also taking place. Those are actionable things taking place in the execution, ex, executing phase of, um, of your project. All right, so let's look at the, the Edo's on page 17 or slide 17. When we execute the project, we need the project management plan. We need to know what is the work. In, there, in that project management plan, you're going to have your work breakdown structure that tells you what the work packages are that you're going to be working on. It's going to tell you what the scope is. It's going to have the requirements. It's going to have all the detailed information so you and the project team know exactly what you're going to be working on, not just... Uh, you know, the, dis the descriptions, the details of that, but it's also going to have the schedule, the timeline of when things are supposed to start and when things are supposed to be completed. So um, the project management plan is the key input to direct and manage project work. Let's go ahead and look at uh, that input page on 17 on the right. We've got uh, um, some brief descriptions that show you a little bit more about what goes into um, direct and manage project work, but the key thing again is your project management plan. Let's jump over to slide 19 and let's look at the tools techniques for direct and manage project work. We've already seen expert judgment, don't need to talk about that. Let's talk a little bit about the PMIS. This is the Project Management Information System. This is where you're storing all your information. This is, uh, you, it's got your um, scheduling tool. It's got, uh, you know, it could be a SharePoint site. It could be a software. It could be um, a, a file system. We're not that archaic, so most of this stuff is electronic in some form or another or some software we use. Um, some of you may have used PlanView before. Um, so really, this is... Um, where we would go to, we would use this information to access uh, what what needs to be done. We could be get, our project management plan could be stored there. Finally, is meetings. Now, most of us have conducted a meeting or two in our lifetime. Um, we probably have our own approach to conducting meetings, but on page eighty four of your PMBOK guide, section four point three point two point three. There is an outline for meetings that I found rather interesting and helpful. Um, 
I, I encourage you to read this. It, it gives you insight into um, a better approach to conducting meetings. All right, so that wraps up the tools and techniques there. And finally, your output for direct and managed project work is your deliverables. Um, that's your key output. However, as you're going through um, your work, you may find that, okay, what was originally outlined in this scope, it's not working because it's turning up uh, some type of result that's not expected. So you may put in a change request. You start, you're direct in managing the project work. Your project team is working on creating the deliverable and then they decide, you know what, we really need to have this changed. So you may, as an output of direct and managed work, you may have the completed deliverable. Um, you could have uh, data elements or um, statistics that you've gathered from just the work that's being done, so that's work performance data, but change requests could also come from direct and managing the work as well. So those are three of the most uh, important things that you really need to know about that. You can have some project management plan updates, uh, project document updates. I encourage you to read about that because it does get a little confusing. I'll probably talk a little bit about that more later. Now let's move into monitor and controlling process group. This is where you're going to monitor and control the project. As I mentioned earlier, there's two processes here. So let's start with the first one, monitor and control pro um, project work. After the planning and you begin to monitor, after planning, you begin monitoring and controlling the team as they're executing the work. Um, you're directing and managing. And you're monitoring, controlling to make sure what's go what they're doing is what was intended to be done, um, that we're on schedule, you're constantly, you know, you're just, you're looking at the picture um, with wide open lens. Um, so the project team will spend most of their time in the executing phase. You're going to direct and manage the project work, but you're going to spend a lot of time in monitoring and trolling. So it's really important that you understand this concept. Make sure you read this a couple of times in your PEMBOT guide. Let's look at the EDOs on slide 22. There's a lot that's going to go into monitoring and controlling the project. You're going to have your project plan, of course, um, schedule forecasts, cost forecast and validated changes. And also you're, you'll notice WPI, that stands for work performance information. So in direct and manage project work, you're gonna pull out work performance data. That's the raw data elements. So we completed five widgets in five hours, boom. That's data, that's just your data. Then once you start to analyze that data, it becomes your, your information that you're going to move into um, you know, a, a more thorough review. So you can pull out a work performance report and create the work performance report. So that's what WPI is, it's work performance information. Um, there is a section in your PMBOK guide that goes through what is, uh, work performance data, work performance information, and work performance reports. It's really important to, um, if you've never seen this concept, this concept and terminology before and you're not that familiar with handling that piece of a project, it's really important that you understand the three because uh, you will get information on your exam and you're going to need to determine is that data information or is that a report. All right, on slide 23, we're talking about the inputs to monitor and control project work. Um, your project plan, schedule forecast, cost forecast, validate changes. Notice these are things that we haven't got to yet in terms of um, understanding what the cost is, understanding what the schedule is. Because as we spoke of earlier, when it comes to integration, you're taking all those subsidiary plans to create your um, your master project management plan. So, um, you know, this is, uh, this these inputs you haven't seen yet, but you will see once you get to those subsidiary plans and start working in those knowledge areas. So there are a lot of inputs here. Um, you don't need to know them all, but you need to know 
uh, validated changes, forecasts, and your project management plan. Those are, those are going to be key. Let's jump onto slide 24. We're talking about tools and techniques here. We've got our expert judgment. We've got meetings. We've got PMIS. You've seen that. But now we've got analytical techniques. So this is where, you know, you're going to have to really put on that thinking cap and you look at the information that's coming in as you're monitoring and controlling um, your project. You'll find yourself having to do some type of analysis, comparative analysis, understanding of um, where where you're at right now versus where you're supposed to be at in the project based on your project plan. So you're going to start to do some, some math, some calculations, some analysis. Um, you'll get more into that piece as you go along through um, scope management and uh, cost management and schedule management and risk management. You'll get into more of those analytical techniques. But I'm going to throw a few out there because I think it's really important that you understand um, when it comes to project management and PMI in this exam, th their understanding going into this, uh, preparing this um, exam content for you is that you already have exposure to um, projects. You've done um, projects and have experience in doing the analytics behind it as well. There's some heavy accounting terms and accounting approaches to the work and this is all experience um, and knowledge that a project manager should have. Um, so there's some uh, analysis here that I've outlined for you like a regression analysis, group analysis, causal, causal analysis, root cause analysis, failure mode and effects analysis, fault tree analysis, I don't have them all memorized, reserve analysis, trend analysis, there's a bunch of them. Um, you don't have to know each one inside out, but just understand at high level what they are, okay? Now, let's look at the final output for the monitor and control project work. Monitor, control, project, work, output could be um, you've identified a, a change request or you've taken all the, the data, work performance data that came from executing um, the project, you've turned it into work performance information, you've performed analysis on it, and now you're turning it into work performance reports. So that could be a report that is an output of monitoring and controlling. Um, there could be project document updates, project management plan updates based on the information or, that you've um, analyzed. But it, key outputs is change requests and work performance reports. So there's one other area I want to talk about um, before we move into the second part of the process processes for monitoring and controlling. And that's um, project management plan update and project management document updates or project document updates. Um, the terminology here is, uh, it, it gets confusing when you're studying for the exam. You've got document updates, plan updates, baselines, uh, work performance data, work performance information, work performance reports. They, it just, it all starts to blend together, especially when you're applying such focus to learning this material. So what I want to do is on slide 26, I'm throwing this out here um, because I found that this was extremely helpful to me. One of my mentors in, um, during the course of the time I was studying for the exam, um, I, it gave me this outline, and you'll see this in your PMBOK guide as well. I didn't mark the page, but uh, um, you, you'll, you'll find it in your chapter three, I believe. Uh, when it comes to document updates and plan updates, anything that has the word plan in it is going to be a project management plan update. So you could have... Um, uh, scope management plan update. Okay, really that's going to be a project management plan update because remember all those subsidiaries roll up to your project management plan. Okay, so um, remember if it has plan in it, they're talking about the project management plan update. 
Um, also, with project management plan, anything that has baseline. So you have your cost baseline, your um, scope baseline, your schedule baseline. All those baselines, those are um, also plan updates. Okay, so if it says plan or it says baseline, it's a project management plan update. Anything else, and you'll notice on the right, there's there's quite a few different types of documents, and this is this isn't. 100% complete. There could be, um, depending on uh, how your organization runs, um, there could be more, but those would just be project document updates. So you'll notice, like when we were talking about the outputs for monitoring and controlling, uh, we had uh, change requests, work performance reports, project management plan updates, and project document updates. Um, so those, those could be outputs, um, but really to make make that distinct distinction between which one is, if I'm working on this, which one is it? Is it going to update the plan or is it just an, a document update? This is a nice little grid to um, reference. So uh, the key to it, if it ends in plan or baseline, it's a project management plan update. Anything else, it's a project, project, project document update. So let's start on slide 27 and talk about monitoring and controlling process and the perform integrated change control. So the whole concept behind perform integrated control is to make sure there's no changes to the project plan that have not been approved. This includes changing the schedule, extending days, shortening days, um, increasing costs or decreasing costs. R regardless if they're favorable or not favorable changes, they all have to go through a performed integrated change control process. Now, there's um, an elaborate process with a control change board where you 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 collect the information from whatever source is saying we need this changed, you review it, you do your analysis on it, and then you ship it off to the control change board to find out if um, they'll approve it, then you can fold it into the project plan. But there are no such things as informal change requests. Every change, regardless how big or small it is, must be documented and approved. So it, you may see something um, come across where development says, okay, we're going to go ahead and do this. And we think we should add this little button to the screen here because that'll improve the, um, the amount of clicks that the uh, reduce the amount of clicks that the end user would ultimately have to do. But that wasn't outlined in the requirements or in the, the scope. So if they were to insert that without going through the change control, that's called gold plating. Gold plating is bad. Um, but that's, uh, they're inserting something into the project that wasn't uh, authorized. So nothing that is, if something it needs to, if something, a change comes in, it needs to be authorized. Um, so in monitoring and controlling and you're performing the integrated change control, you'll be doing this throughout the project. Um, it, it has to come to you. You have to review it. You have to um, decide whether or not uh, it needs to move through the process. Um, and go to get official approval or it needs to be shut down. A lot of times you as a project manager will um, use great influence to determine whether or not what's being requested is really valid. Um, so uh, that's what really perform integrated control is about. Let's, uh, let's also talk a little bit about um, um, the Edos here. Uh, don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, I, you guys are going to get enough of this in your PMBOK guide and the materials that we're giving you, but this one's really important. Again, perform integrated change controls. Nothing goes in unless it's approved. Bottom line, nothing goes in unless it's approved. So let's jump into the inputs, tools, techniques. This is on slide 29. Okay, so Obviously, you're going to need your project management plan to be able to understand where you're supposed to be, what is accepted, and um, 
also in your project management plan. Remember when I talked about in the development of the project management plan, you're going to decide how you're going to manage this project. Well, part of that management plan it would outline how are you going to handle changes? What steps are you going to take? Who do you escalate to? Does it go to your sponsor? Is there an official change control board, CCB? Um, that's what change control board, the acronym is CCB. Are you going to send this to a CCB? Who are these CCB people? Um, how are they going to, what format do they need this information? What type of analysis do you have to have done ahead of time? So that would be in your project management plan. And that's why that's an input to this um, particular uh, process. Also, you got work performance reports. Maybe the reports are kind of telling you, okay, this is why we need to do something or we need to make a change. And then you have your change requests. Um, jumping over to slide uh, 30, there's a, a more detailed description of your inputs. We just talked about those. Let's go to 31, which is tools and techniques. Okay, we've seen these before, except for change control tools. Change control tools could be um, a variety of things. Uh, you'll read about those in your PMBOK guide, but really um, uh, you, could, you could have uh, some type of online enhancement request log type of um, system going on that you're using, which is used to get information to your change control board. Um, you'll read about that more, but change control tools, expert judgment, and meetings. You definitely need to have meetings to talk about the changes that are being requested. All right, and finally, let's talk about the outputs. Outputs would be your approved changes, updates to a change log, um, Maybe updates to the project management plan. Maybe the scope of work has changed. So you have to change the scope baseline. And it's been approved, so you update scope baseline, which, remember what I told you, if it says baseline or plan, it's going to be a update to the management plan. Um, you could have updates to the documents. Maybe your work approach is going to change going forwards or a process is changing. So you're going to, um, maybe you change that. Maybe a report you um, have to update. So if I said change log and I said baseline, which one of them is a project document update? Change log would be a project document update. Baseline would be a project management plan update because it's it says baseline. So we're going to begin on the close process group. We're almost to the finish line with integration management. So in the close process group, um, it, you know, all projects are required to go through this particular process. And one thing to note is, uh, that even if a project is in the middle of the work and let's say funding runs out, it's the plug has been pulled, the sponsor no longer wants it, the contract's been terminated, you have to still close the project because the project authorized resources and funds and systems and it, you could have a team of people who in the middle of the project, it gets canceled, you need to know what to do with these people. So part of the close process um, a part of the project, regardless of how the overall disposition is going to end up, you need to go through close project. Um, so uh, naturally, um, in, close, in the close process group, this is where you're going to deliver the final um, service, hand over the result or um, product um, over to your client. Um, there's a couple of things to note about closed project, and this can get a little confusing. Um, there's two types of closures that's happening. There's administrative closure, which is um, closing out activities, closing or transferring the service or result over to someone, um, close out activities where you're administrative closeout activities where you get everyone together you do a post-mortem or you gather lessons learned um, and also when you finally tell the team thank you very much 
you're released and now you can go on to your next project. So those are administrative types of closures. Um, that, then there is the actual close of the project. That's where all activities have been finalized and you formally conduct a closure and put a stamp on it and sign it and file away everything and you're done. Um, so uh, just understand what the difference between an administrative closure um, activity is versus the overall closing of a project. Let's talk about the EDOs. EDOs, uh, your project management plan, obviously, accepted deliverables. If you do not have your client signing off saying that they accepted those deliverables, your project is not closed. You need to make sure that what you were set out to do on this project has been completed, has been approved and accepted, okay? So an input to closing the project is the project management plan, also the accepted deliverables. Now, let's go back. If the project was uh, cut, pulled the plug, are you gonna have accepted deliverables? No, but you still need to close the project and that's where your project management plan comes into play as your input. Remember, when you develop that project management plan, you're gonna talk, you're going to outline the plan of how you're gonna handle all these possible scenarios what if this happens? How am I going to do this? What's the roadmap for this plan? What happens if it cancels? What steps do I need to take? So um, that's why your project management plan is there. All right, so slide 35, it uh, is a breakdown of those inputs. Um, let's go over to slide 36. Let's look at our tools and techniques. Um, I promise you, you're going to see this expert judgment quite a bit. So that one should be really easy to start to memorize as a tool and technique is expert judgment. Um, you need expert judgment because uh, you need to know, um, has everything been completed? As a project manager, this is where your expert judgment comes into play. Um, analytic, analytical techniques. Um, you're going to need to uh, perform um, analysis to, to wrap up your um, report, uh, your, your project. You don't have to, you may have that in there. So um, again, with all the tools and techniques, it doesn't mean that you have to use each and every tool and technique because remember we talked about tailoring decisions. Some things you may do, some things you may not do, and you identified that early on when you were developing your project management plan. Same thing when it comes to the tools and techniques. These are just the Project Management Institute's um, standards, um, body of knowledge, recommendation. This is how you'll be tested on the exam, but it's not necessarily going to um, work in every project scenario. Finally is meetings. Um, we talked about that. You guys are already familiar with that. And finally is our outputs to close project or phase. And that is your final product, service, or result and transition. Um, that is uh, pretty much it for project integration management. It's really important that although you've gone through this session, um, you know, it, it, this is one of the first, this is the first session that covers a knowledge area. After you've completed the rest of the knowledge areas, I invite you to come back and re-watch integration management. I found in my own effort to study for the exam that integration was a little overwhelming at first because there's some, there's some items that are talked about and some concepts and the way way the integration elements move that I, I hadn't even covered scope or cost or risk or procurement or HR, etc. I hadn't covered any of those yet. So I really didn't get the full big picture at that time. After you've gone through the other knowledge areas, I recommend coming back, just browsing through the chapter for integration to help reinforce and turn that light bulb, light bulb on for you so all this begins to make even more sense. All right, well, I would like to thank you very much for your time. This covers 
the introduction to project integration management. Next up, you will uh, have a video on project scope management. And that's it. Have a great day.